afternoon celebrating Ada Lovelace Day. So just checking that we're all okay. Welcome to our PSC celebration of women's contribution to Australia's digital age. It is an honour personally to be able to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Boorong and Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation and all of the traditional custodians who belong to the lands where the PC Foundation and you, our guests, meet, live and work across our country. We acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today and their elders, past, present and emerging, whose stories, traditions and living cultures in this country are a valuable resource, as are all of those who've come to make Australia our their home. Together we are Australia. So my name is Kelly Hutchinson and it's my joy today to welcome you to our PC Foundation Ada, Ada Lovelace event, celebrating women's contribution to Australia's digital age. I would like to especially welcome and thank and acknowledge those contributing today who truly are inspiring from all around the country. And those of you who are Zooming in or coming to join us later on Catch Up, which is one of the wonders of Zoom and, and all of this new technology that strangely enough is a side benefit, I think, of um, this acceleration due to the pandemic. There is a bit of a silver lining. And we have a amazing amount of speakers and I would encourage you all also in um, the Q&A to, or the chat, to be able to um, put your ideas forward and, and share your memories. And this is just the beginning of our, um, our foray into finding our Australian pioneers uh, of women in the digital age. The PSC Foundation was started 22 years ago to celebrate, support and encourage individuals who embrace technology for the betterment of society. And the PSC Foundation's Heritage Project, which some of you may know about, um, kicked off earlier this year, really in earnest, with the aim to become the central repository of um, the stories of our culture, hosting a virtual museum of Australia's computing artefacts, documents, and also oral histories. So acknowledging that also oral herstories, as we would say on Ada Lovelace Day. We hope as PSC Foundation of your support and help that you will encourage all of us in our organisations to unearth, amplify and record some of the stories of women who've contributed to Australia's computing history. So myself and I'm sure all of you are looking forward to hearing the stories from our female pioneers on their career journeys. We also know there are some on the line who are pioneers themselves and we ask all of you to share your anecdotes and stories and observations of the conversation today. And we know that when you're listening and the talking, you're hearing and remembering things because our memories are engaged with ideas and stories of an oral nature but also history and reading. We've had a couple of books held up by our panelists today, which have reminded us all about different stories and being able to share and link to each other. So we do have chat and Q&A, and also we have a mural board, which is another platform for collaboration, which is like, we all miss a whiteboard. This is the way for you to be able to, you know, get out your virtual white markers, or as one of our panelists said, get your chalkboard out and actually share um, some of your own memories. And also, you could also just email us. Um, and you're also welcome to join our Slack channel. We like to embrace new tools and live um, the values of exploration that many of the women who are here today are going to going to share their experience. We're also proud today to announce uh, we're kicking off an initiative called Letters to My Younger Self. These letters to my younger self were a way for us to record the stories of women in our midst and place them front and centre so we can acknowledge and learn from these stories. We often hear a, st um, a, a phrase, we cannot be what we cannot see. And I think there's been massive amounts of shift over time that many of the women who are involved here have been part of advocacy for women in STEM and girls. And today we have in Victoria a number of events all over the state, all over the country that look at the way that young women, mid-career women, primary school girls can all be involved. And these stories, Letters to My Younger Self, are such a great inspiration and a resource for all of these different programs. And part of our partners is with the Tech Girls Foundation, who are definitely leading in this way, and we're really delighted to be able to partner with them. 
So before we get on, I'm going to just say that we also run awards because one of the things about the PSE Foundation is that we, we do value the importance of recognising success. You know, we have quite a lot of challenges um, and we as tall poppies don't seem to like to, you know, big note yourself. So there's a real need for peer recognition of the achievements of people in mid-career or lifetime achievements. So today we have the New South Wales Entrepreneur of the Year Award to be announced and we'll be back on the same Zoom line, so after five o'clock, to hear the much anticipated announcement of the New South Wales Entrepreneur of the Year. Professor Mary O'Kane, one of our medalists, will be sure to lead an inspiring panel discussion with some of our past New South Wales PSC Award winners. Again, it's about recognising and celebrating the achievements and then being able to have these people as role models, which is, is really what we're all about. And also please save a date for the National PSC Awards being held on Wednesday, the 25th of November, which will also be the final conversation. We've been having conversations at the last week of the month every um, couple of months now, and it's really been a great way for us to connect nationally. And we will also be bestowing this year's national recipients of the 2020 PSC Medal, Hall of Fame and Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. And we'll have an opportunity to hear from some of industry greats on their predictions of for the year ahead. So getting into the business of what we're going to do today, how to ask questions. Thank you to those who've already sent through some questions for our amazing lineup. We encourage you to use the Q&A function here on Zoom to ask any further questions of our speakers or of me or generally as they come up and don't be shy in giving any questions you like. And you can also give a thumbs up to any of the questions ago. If you see that somebody's written something that makes a lot of sense, you can give it a thumbs up and that gets um, higher up in the view for me and the team to be able to make sure we don't miss that question. We also said about sharing ideas through the mural board where you can have anything you like. And for those of you who are new to mural, just have a go. One of the things we, as technologists, we love to play and investigate. I think that's one of the things and technology gives you so many opportunities to do that. And um, the world of software as a service is just magnificent. So we do encourage you to use all the different tools to communicate with us. And one day we really hope to be able to just meet up and have a coffee. Um, I'm in Melbourne in lockdown for a long time now and um, we're very lucky to be able to join each other and celebrate what we're able to do as um, a country and today particularly to look at and celebrate the wonderful contributions of these amazing female computing pioneers who are all exceptionally humble and we're just going to try and make this a relaxed conversation to explore some of that. So we're going to shine a light on some of the often untold stories of our four sisters. I raised a couple of years ago that we really needed to find Australia's hidden figures. So if you know of that film that was um, around the women mathematicians um, in NASA, there are so many people's stories and so many people of the female persuasion that have been missing in the stories. So that is why we decided to go ahead and it made perfect sense to do this on Ada Lovelace Day. So without further ado, let's get started. Or without further ado, let's get started. First up, we're going to go down the rabbit hole. So I'd like to introduce the first of our few speakers. All of their bios are on the website, so I'll keep my introductions to a minimum. I'd first like to invite Alison Harcourt to speak. So Alison is a renowned mathematician and statistician. We're so privileged to hearing, her, hearing from her today. And I was, Alison, I was hoping if you could just kick off and let us know what led you to become a statistician. Kelly, it was pure accident because what I was supposed to be becoming was a mathematician. Yeah. Then I had a nasty shock because I failed in physics year three at university, unstandardly. So I had to repeat a year and to fill in the, cab, the sort of category of what I was doing, I took this funny subject called Theory of Statistics, part right. one. Well, I got through the physics, but I did not like it. 
but did I like statistics? It just was what I wanted to do. It suited me. I like the fact that you're using mathematics, but you're looking at people and you're looking at big groups of people and wondering how you can help them and what information you can gather from them. So that was it. But can I go back to a, a long time ago? Let's go back 80 years. 1939, there were three important things. In January, on Friday the 13th, Black Friday, I was in Lord and we got through because Lord escaped. The fires were all round, but Lord, fortunately, the wind changed. And later in the year, in early September, Robert Menzies got up and said, Britain has declared war on Germany and we are, of course, therefore we're in war. But the third important thing happened in a little town called Colac when a teacher picked up a chalk and started to show his sixth grade, he drew a triangle. Now, every mathematician knows what comes next. Kelly, do you know? No, no, not, not your, that was not your subject. But he drew this triangle, he added lines, and at the end, he said there. And that was the first time that I had seen Pythagoras' theorem, which has been a, a sort of bright light to me all through. It's the most flexible and wonderful thing. So that was it. And I knew that, well, I knew from kindergarten that I liked numbers. I knew that I had a mathematical future because he saved it. So many thanks to Mr. Smith, Colac High School, 1939, and what he did for me. Excellent. Thank you, Alison. I think it's, it's, it's often that inspire, inspiration from a teacher that opens up something. And also that idea that you said you thought you were going to do this, but then something else inspired you to learn something that wasn't what you were thinking of. And being open to that is, is really that pioneering spirit. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd also like to introduce Kerry Mangerson here. She's a distinguished professor of statistics. Queensland University of Technology and a country girl. Um, sorry, I'm just looking through here. Is it true you thought you might have wanted to become a vet? Yes, yes, I was going to all the way through university, all the way through school. Uh, I grew up in Coonabarabran, uh, well, in smaller schools. My first school was in Mullally, which was a two-teacher school. So when you got into trouble, you got sent to the other teacher um, in, in, um, in, in, in primary school. And then I went to um, Coonabarabran school and, uh, and I was keen to be a vet. We also there at Coona, we had the, uh, the observatory. And, uh, and so it was, that was a great inspiration actually to see that there was real science at work. So it was, uh, Great to have that combination of science and uh, and inspiration of, of science at work. Great. So, Alison, um, just some questions for you. You actually, you know, PSC Foundation is really looking at major historical objects, particularly CIRAC, you know, um, and you actually managed to work and, and have an experience with CIRAC. Could you share that with you, with us? Well, that, that was the intention. And I can remember going to a series of lectures that were being given to us so that we knew how to use CIRAC and all was going well. And I had beautiful notes that I'd recorded of the teaching. Um, then my appendix blew up and I stopped and went to hospital instead. Oh, right. <laughs> so I never finished that training. Uh. And so I, I do not have any record of using CIRAC. Right. But you got to see it, I suppose. I, oh, I got to see it. And <laughs> indeed, um, although I didn't know it, but my husband did use CIRAC a lot because okay. he was doing a, a, 
a master's in chemistry mm -hmm. and he used Tarek. So we, oh. we do have some connection to it. Oh, excellent. And look, I mean, the thing about Tarek is it, you know, it was applied, it was applied to so many different disciplines. So it's interesting to hear about the application to chemistry. Um, so can you tell us how you ended up in England? There's a lot of time between England and Australia throughout the pioneers, the women that we've seen here. Um, how did you get to England? What put the idea in your head? And I, I, I dare to ask, um, one of the things I think that happens is that we, uh, we have to leave our country to find ourselves. And um, how did you find that journey um, in your time in England? Well, I, I kept on with the statistics because I, I just liked it more and more. Mm -hmm. And when it came to doing a, um, a maths a master's degree, didn't quite know at the time what to do. And then the professor, Professor Bells at the time said, Alison, have a look at this paper. And it was from a Canadian journal and it was about a new technique called linear programming. Now, I had already heard a bit about that because, um, now who was it? Um, there was a, an engineering graduate from Melbourne who'd gone to Domain, to, to Darain for the oil, all the oil fields. He came back to Melbourne and told us about this new technique called linear programming, which I felt was really exciting. And this Canadian paper referred to linear programming. And I read it through and said, well, that's remarkable. They've, they've done this calculation. They've got the answers all in integers. And because of the paper that was about cutting up rolls of paper, um, you had to cut up a whole roll. You couldn't cut up three quarters of a roll, etc. So I looked at it and said, how did they get them all integers? And my professor said, go and find out. So I settled to work. And now a confession, it was very simple. So I sort of worked a bit on that. And about that time, there was a visiting professor from Britain around. And um, he said, well, you know, suppose you come over and work with one of the people in my university, because she's also working on linear programming, and the two of you should get together. And that's how I came to meet Ailsa Land, who was really brilliant, and, but an economist at London School of Economics. And Ailsa and I worked together, sort of developed my idea, which I put into a, a very primitive sort of thesis, but um, we worked on it and came out with an idea which showed what can be done. And um, then su submitted a paper to Econometrica, and which at the time was the noted journal for that type of mathematical economics. Um, quite deliberately, and this is where the female part comes in, we sent it off as from A. H. Land and A. G. Doig. No indication, it was going to an American journal, no indication that we were both women. It took them a long time to come to judge, but in the end, yes, it was accepted. And that's the an automatic method of getting into just solutions. That's who's, and that was the paper. Um, and about the time that that came out, um, I came back to Australia to take up a position um, in the stats department at University of Melbourne. So there's the beginning. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And interesting that insight that by having just your initials, it meant your work is what was uh, assessed, not anything yes. else. Yeah. Nothing else, yes. And so universities obviously is where both of you have worked, um, Alison and, and Kerry. Um, how have you found your career through that um, um, 
environment and Kerry, you're a distinguished professor of statistics, which is an achievement. Um, but what are you most proud of in, in your career? Mm. Tricky, Alison. tricky. I'm, I'm really most proud, I think, um, in terms, and this is in terms of its impact, probably the poverty survey with Professor Henderson, which was comes a, a few years after I got back to Melbourne. That's, that's the one that I think had some really, well, countrywide effect. Yeah, wonderful. And it is that practical application of technology to better society. I think, you know, you really encapsulated it there. And Kerry, I know some of the work that you've done, you know, you've looked at environment, you've looked at cancer, you know, some very, very challenging issues. Um, how, what can you share with us? Yeah, I think the, uh, the world of, uh, of computing and statistics has changed even my, in my time. So I can imagine from, um, from the earlier times seeing that change. But uh, when I came to the university, as I said, I was going to be a vet and then ended up because Going, being a vet meant you had to go to Sydney and uh, had, I was good at maths, good at English, didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went to Armidale University, so University of um, New England in Armidale. So it was a country university and not so far away from home. And, uh, and so shout out to all the country universities that really uh, allow kids from the country to, uh, to go to uni. And, uh, and for me then, uh, one way or another, I ended up in statistics because it was a subject that I didn't understand. And so then at the time, it was really a start of having personal computers. And so having a computer on your desk rather than having to carry all of the cards down to the, the mainframe computer room and go back three days later to, to get the results. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the world of computing and also the world of computational statistics was really just starting for, uh, in this field. And it was so exciting and bringing together uh, the computer scientists and the, uh, the statisticians and mathematicians and, and developing these kind of um, numerical solutions and computational solutions that opened up the world of uh, bringing the data in and then being able to tell these amazing stories about what the data was showing about the environment and health and industry and, and so on. And to me, that was really exciting to be able to develop the, the theory and the methodology and have the underpinning mathematics and statistics. But then also, as, as Alison said, you know, overlaying uh, that with the, the, the what, how do you interpret that for the benefit of the, the, uh, you know, the environment or for people and so on. And so today then, uh, you know, building uh, digital products, I guess, that uh, incorporate the, 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 the sophisticated statistics and mathematics and modelling that we can use, but to build, for example, an interactive atlas of cancer that for the first time people can access you know, uh, so incidents and survival estimates at their particular local area uh, around Australia and to be then able to use that to identify disparities in survival uh, for different cancers and to then that make that um, or to use that then to change policy and uh, you know that having that sort of flow on effect and feeling that as a statistician uh, um, you, you can be part of that whole uh, change uh, in our in our culture and our, our health status. Thank you so much for both of you sharing really how that intersection of different um, um, areas that have intersected to create something new and um, and also applicable to our lives. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences there. And of course, I think we can see that universities are really important and they influence the education and what you might have started with isn't what you ended up doing. I think the, the challenges are, of, um, you know, embracing your curiosity to go down that rabbit hole during your life because you're curious is definitely the essence what I see and hear from from both of you so thank you so much for sharing your stories you know we could of course keep talking all day and I got nice goosebumps at the end there um, Terry when you were talking about you know that really detailed application of that technology and stats to a health issue which is something we're definitely dealing with now with COVID-19 and pandemic and tracing and, and the like so thank you very much now we do have a Q&A um, 
function. So if you'd like to put in a question there, I'll come back to them. Um, you can ask a question of, of Kerry or Alison and I can come back to that later. But we're going to move in now to finding our superpowers is our theme for this next section. And this really is around um, how can you know, really be inspired and what is the strength that drives us? Um, and we have some really interesting um, women here to talk to us. Um, we have Michelle Melbourne, who is the co-founder of Intellidox. Um, and her career started with rats, stats and dats is what I've been told. So can you tell us a bit more about that, um, Michelle? G'day Kelly and hi everybody. It's so great to be here. Hi everyone. Um, and I too had uh, goosebumps listening to Alison and Kerry. It's a real privilege. Uh, look, uh, rats, stats and dats. So if you have a little bit of a think about it, um, I actually did a science degree at the ANU more than 30 years ago. And that was born out of some intense curiosity that I had about the world and about everything and everyone. And rats, stats and dats is... Uh, the summary of my degree. So I actually did a double degree in psychology, computer science and statistics. And the computer science was a bit of a blow in because uh, my dad, who was a land surveyor, said to me in 1987, when I was choosing my subjects in my science degree, he said, Shelley, you should do some computing subjects. It might come in handy one day. And fast forward 30 years, um, uh, it certainly has. Rats, stats and dats. Rats, stats uh, and dats, I love it. Technology. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, your first job, um, you know, around that time was also in training. So how did that quit with you with your new skills once you've, you know, gone through that science degree? Well, it's a funny, it's a funny story. Um, it, it's actually one of those sliding doors moments where your life can take a left hand turn and you can choose to go through that door or not through that door. It's a great movie if you haven't ever seen sliding doors. Um, it, so I actually ended up taking a job in the, in the big smoke in Sydney after finishing my degree at the ANU. Um, I was a poor student and was keen to earn some money. And uh, there was a, a technology startup in, in Sydney. Um, uh, this is in 1990. So a startup 30 years ago uh, by one of the early um, Microsoft executives uh, that was in Australia. Now this is pre Windows or this is, well, this is the, the heady days of DOS and, and the desktop computing revolution where uh, stenographers and typists were all being disrupted and they were all out of a job and they, they were all being retrained uh, to, to use these computers. And indeed, executives in, you know, some of Australia's largest corporates in those days were, oh, let me think, um, Commonwealth Bank and Telstra. All of their executives were being given a computer on their desk and this was this was massive transformation and they were all in psychological meltdown um, with this massive change. And I was very fortunate enough to be selected for a position that was probably two levels above my experience grade um, as a technology trainer. So I knew how to use a word processor. I knew how to use word for DOS, but I didn't know anything else. I knew nothing. And the irony is that's why I got the job because my boss, number one, he couldn't afford to pay experienced teachers to be technology trainers. He was a startup, wasn't he? So he took a, he took a chance on me and basically taught me that, well, you just had to be one page ahead in the manual of the rest of the class. You didn't actually have to know it all. You just had to be a little bit ahead of the rest of the class. And so I took that, that philosophy, if you like, um, and turn that into a very successful corporate career in, this, in enterprise software. And this concept of always taking the next version, always being open to ingesting what's new, discovering what's new and, and, and updating what you've already got became uh, you know, a 30 year career. So teaching, well, pff, uh, gosh, we were using five and a quarter inch floppy disks in 
in these computers to set up a corporate training, um, a, a corporate training classroom. Uh, the team that I worked with invented a screen sharing switch so that, uh, you know, the classroom could see the instructor's screen. And these were kind of revolutionary things that we we're inventing as we needed them. Now you just share your screen, you know, with technology like this that we're using today. But these things were being invented out of necessity more than 30 years ago. And so once you get good at being a technology trainer, you realize that technology is all about the people. It's all about their ability to ideate, to communicate, um, to, to navigate, to explore how technology can help them do their work better. Whether you're an executive at Telstra or whether you're uh, a cancer scientist researching trends and patterns, I don't think it's changed 30 years ago and it's still the same today. Technology is about how your expert people can help you accelerate solving problems or visualise problems. Thank you so much. I mean, I think all of us can resonate with that experience. And um, I know all about the, you know, I did microcomputer applications for art students on those floppy disks um, in the 1989. Yeah. So what... I think what I'm hearing there is that, you know, really understanding people and being able to adapt and helping them adapt. And that's really an, an extrovert's approach. And a lot of the time, you know, um, uh, technologists are introverts, but what's the superpower of being an extrovert in this industry? What have you found in that? And particularly is that, you know, is that something to do with being a woman or is it just, you know, you know seeing the opportunities there? Well, Kelly, it's, it's a bit um, uh, Darwinian, I think, for me. So I, when I was doing my, probably my second year computer science subjects, I realised that there were many, many, many supersonic smart people in that room that, you know, in the lab that I should go make friends with because they could explain it to me better than perhaps the lecturer had explained it and really fulfil a lot of knowledge that I had. And in doing that, the extrovert, communicative personality really, it, it was, I don't know how to describe it. I can see it now. I can picture it all those years ago. It was like this weird thing had arrived in the lab. And, you know, how do you tell if a software engineer is an extrovert or an introvert? Well, the extrovert's checking out your shoes, not their own, right? So here I was talking to these incredibly intelligent people who were looking down all the time and you know group work was something that we had to do and I just loved it I loved getting helping them to look up and look out and explain what they were thinking and explain what they were doing and I made a career out of um, helping people to understand that nerd is the new black and that what what was going on in the room that that was kind of silent needed some reverence um, and some encouragement and patience to kind of harness and unlock the the incredible horsepower of of, of what was what what goes on in 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 the brains of of my classmates and so for me it turned into uh, you know a commercial business career starting a, a company. Um, that ended up being a global software company and, you know, hiring and working and collaborating with some of the smartest um, software engineers from around the world to build um, some intellectual property that was owned, you know, here in Australia. Um, and that we've um, just recently been able to exit from and create a whole magnificent entrepreneurial journey for for a whole lot of uh, software engineers in Australia, and they will certainly be paying that forward as they go forward in their next the next stage of their careers. Fantastic! Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it does need to have that um, that balanced approach and being able to see. Um, and I like the idea of getting people to look up from their feet. Um, but acknowledging that not everybody processes information the same way. So by you being the advocate and seeing the opportunity and going out there and grabbing it, you did deliver and create this global thing. So I think it's really, 
uh, wonderful and I met you oh, a number of years ago so I'm so excited to see how the exit went and you know that's a really really successful story so so congratulations on that so I'm going to hand over now to Anne Moffat who is an inspiration um, as all of you are but Anne Telly worked in the Formula One in the UK so we're all Telly working at the moment but you know she really took it on and was a real pioneer in this space um, and had so many different pioneering experiences, you know, from corporates in AMP, but she's also founder of FIT, Females in IT and Telecommunications, um, with, with a number of other women who identified that there was real challenges in, in progressing careers. So you've had such a rich life, Anne. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you found your superpowers um, and, and, you know, share some of your story with us. I just feel I've just had a, a, a ball. I mean, I, I, I've just been, I feel as if I've been paid lots and lots of money for just enjoying myself the whole time. Um, I, as I say, I came into the industry in 1959 and I love the PC history because I love the history of the, of the industry. Um, the guy who taught me to program was Conway Berners-Lee. And if that name rings a bell, he was the father of Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web. And he actually brought little four-year-old Tim in for me to look after, because I was the only woman in the class, in the computing class. So if you touch my hand, I've touched the hand that, touched the hand that invented the World Wide Web. <laughs> um, but but it, it's been a fascinating life. And, and I'd like to go on and really talk about a, a woman who's made a big change in my life, that's Steve Shirley. Steve um, decided that she would set up a business working from home for herself. Now I tried that, I'd worked for Kodak, I'd worked in operations research on all the things that we were hearing about, linear programming and PERT and goodness knows what, writing programs for Kodak for that, to handle all their production control and process control. But um, When I left, when I actually left Kodak to have my first baby, they gave me work to do at home. And what I found was that although I was well paid and well looked after, um, whenever I went into, into the office to talk about my work, they changed everything, but they hadn't, they'd forgotten to tell me because I wasn't there. I was sort of working from home. So after a month, I felt very frustrated, but somebody had just cut a little notice out of a, a, a a, new, a newspaper before I left work to say that um, there was this lady called Steve Shirley, she's now Dame Steve Shirley, very famous in England, um, to give work to women working from home when they looked after their babies at home. So I applied to join. When I joined, there were 11 people in the company and there were about seven of them working from home and four of them working in the office, managing the people working from home. That was the, the, the idea. But it wasn't working. The, the, the people at home felt they were doing all the work, which they probably were, and the people in the office felt that the people at home were looking after their babies and, and concentrating on their children rather than the work. Steve was very keen when she interviewed me because she just sold the... Um, a, 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 um, a project to analyze the black box flight recorder from Concord. Concord new aircraft hadn't flown and it was decided that every time the, the plane flew its black box would be analyzed, the data would be analyzed before it was allowed to fly, fly again. So there were about 40,000 instruments on the flight deck of the original Concord and they were each read about four times a second. So masses and masses of data. So for the statisticians amongst you, I was a statistician, so I loved that. Um, but Steve sold the project as a one person project. And there was far more work than I needed. It was also written in machine code, which by this time, most people weren't using. They were using an auto code or COBOL or something like that. But I'd started my life in 59 on machine code. so. I could still code in machine code. Um, in the end, there were 20 people on that project that were sold as a one-person project. 
but British, the British Aircraft Corporation saw that we were all working very hard. And in fact, the Concorde design was changed because of some of the statistical work we did. They redeveloped the wing and the Concorde flew a lot later than it was supposed to fly. So that was my first introduction. And I had managed people at Kodak and I got the job of managing the home base programmers. And from that day on, all the programmers were managed by people working from home in the same environment. Um, it was very successful. By the time I left, eight years later, I was technical director. We had 400 people working from home and we worked for most of the big companies in England. Um, and it's been my passion to try and get people to telework, as we call it now. We just called it working from home. Because I know from statistics we kept that people working from home were twice as productive as people working in an office environment. And in fact, I started and nearly finished a PhD on the subject. Um, people work in the office, it's said, not by my research, but others' research, that they spend half their time politicking, game playing, and socializing. Whereas people working from home don't do that. They just get stuck into the work and do their work. And that's really why they're much more productive. Um, I've seen somebody comes, comes in with a meeting. No offense to Tim Berners-Lee, but I'm more impressed in you that you work for Steve Shirley. <laughs> no, Steve's wonderful. Steve actually ended up by being a multi, multi-millionaire and because she started working from home because her son was autistic. Now, we didn't know what autism was in those days. He was just peculiar. Um, but she loved him dearly and he was so good looking and so lovely. But she decided that, that she would fund autism research and she gave $76 million of her own money to fund pounds, not millions of pounds, to fund autism research in England. And she's very well known for that philanthropic part of her life in England. Mm. Working from home was really interesting. We, we worked very hard on statistics about individuals, about projects, about being able to estimate using all the statistics we gathered. And that's why the company was so successful. It was also successful because in the 60s, there was a dearth of programmers and we were given, giving work to people who had skills in the industry, but of course, had not, if they hadn't been able to work, those skills would have been lost to the industry. The thing I love about computing is that there's always new stuff to learn. There is still always new stuff to learn. I mean, Moore's law that, that um, computing power would double every 18 months and, and the price of computing would halve every 18 months, that still holds today. I think with quantum computer, we're even going to bust that law. But, but that's really what, what's, what's great at, at working in computing. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, those insights of the working from home from that era and really that point about, you know, um, as a manager and that's around the people of knowing that you really are best to manage from the same situation so that you're actually able to, to really lead that team. So I think, you know, some amazing pioneering work in, in that, that we could all learn from now, you know, um, with this whole transition to working at home. I haven't been in the office since March. I'd like to make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, when I started to do my PhD, I was looking at um, what would happen if we used the, the things that made set teleworking successful, and I know what those are. If we used those in an office environment, uh, my theory was, my thesis was, that we could make people in an office environment 20% more productive. So I put in teleworking initiatives for Lendlease and for Telstra and for the, Brit for the Australian government. But I found that even though they were, they were agreed by the management, Nobody was allowed to telework. Yes, if you broke your leg, you're allowed to work from home, but, but you, people weren't allowed to just work from home anyhow. So I've tried to find out, well, why aren't people being allowed to work from home? And when I take the, the managers out to lunch or, or dinner, um, I don't drink much wine. I like one glass, but one glass does be fine. But I find if you're with a guy, you can make him drink two bottles of wine while you have one, and then you can learn all sorts of things. But what I found was the reason that managers said they didn't like people working from home was 
they felt people wouldn't work at home, they wouldn't work as well as if they were watched. But no, that isn't the answer. The answer is when you really get two bottles of red wine into a manager, he says, if it could be found that my staff could work better, better more productively at home, there wouldn't be a job for me. So that was really what was holding it up, that the managers, the Australian managers don't seem to understand that, that a manager's job is to strategize and make sure that the resources are there so that his staff can be the best they can be. It's not to watch them. It's not, it, it, so management needs to change. Management needs to understand that, yes, people are productive, and I've given so many talks on that, and yet teleworking didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. Now it has, all of a sudden. And people are finding that people actually can work from home and can be productive working from home. And hopefully the managers will realise what their role is. I think, you know, as, um, as I said earlier, that the, the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of technology due to necessity. So we've seen this in telehealth and we're seeing it in teleworking. Like we've always had the technology, but the cultural shift, the cultural change. Absolutely. Um, and that really is the same thing that, that Shelley, you were talking about, that the adoption of, we stuck these computers on everybody's desk, but the cultural shift of actually taking that, oh, I have to do my own typing or I have to learn how to do this myself. I remember being an admin assistant when computers were first introduced and then everybody became a desktop publisher. And I, I became a bit of a, um, a control freak on design. But anyway, you know, so it's all this introduction of technology to enable what we do. Um, and it's really interesting to hear how things have changed but not changed. And I think that's why it's important to gather these stories to see the points whereby things, you know, have been tickling along for a while. And I, I totally hear you about that management stuff. So I'm going to say that there was a question in the chat from Alison, um, and she was talking about that, you know, that we've got to move faster and focus on education um, is an area. So I think Shelley's advanced uh, and, and answered a question there, but we might come back to that a little bit later. So what do you think in the end would be what you would want to say to your um, younger self? What would be the top thing you'd like to, to remind others? I'd say, do what you love. And if you're not, and if you're working for somewhere and you're really not enjoying it, you're in the wrong place. Get out and get to somewhere that you love. Now, my passions in life are bringing up my children to make them be as, as wonderful as they are now. They're both in their 50s now and they're fantastic. Bringing up my children, traveling. And I'm very fortunate that my career has taken me all over the world. And, and just, just doing, bringing, bringing good computing to entities and if there's anything that really annoys me at the moment it's two things firstly it's all these systems that go down due to malware at one stage i was responsible for all the compute the the software at the stock exchange australian stock exchange now if the stock exchange computing hadn't been robust hadn't been tested properly we would be reading about it every day that it had fallen down. I used to test, test, test. And this is something that women bring. Women test, 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 test. And Stock Exchange used to be really pissed off with me as if, you know, we've got this woman to, to manage this stuff and all she's doing is telling us to test. What's wrong with her staff? Can't they test? And I said, no, no. The, the, the testing's got to be done by the business people as well. Well, we couldn't get the brokers to test computers. And for goodness sake, this was the 1980s, October 80, just before the October crash. They, the, the market was buzzing. They didn't have time to do anything but make money. But I absolutely insisted that the, 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 um, the brokers test. And what we did, we backed up the system at three o'clock because the market finished at three in those days. And then we put on 50 stocks on the market on the market on a separate system and we made the brokers test um, um, uh, trade against each other and the, the broker that got the most money in three the three nights of testing we all put champagne and we put caviar and goodness knows what in their offices to entice them in but the guy who the 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 broker who got the most money got a gold bar and the three runners up got a bag of gold coins and of course 
what happened? The brokers found something, some things they didn't like that they wanted changed. And again, the bosses at Stock Exchange said, this stupid woman, you know, if we hadn't asked them to test, we would never have found that out. But of course, when the crash did come, and this is one of my proudest moments, Australia was one of the only company, countries in the world that, whose computers actually stayed up during that crash. The day before we'd put in a huge change of, to put in automated trading, fully automated trading in, and the seed, still the systems stood up. And I think, I think that's because we tested so much. And of course, then I was a hero. Testing then became the proper, but, but women do. They, they don't want to be found doing something wrong. So they test, test, test. Men, just give it a quick foot, float, whirl on last week's production data and it'll work. No. That's Sorry, but that, I'm passionate about that. So. No, I think that's fantastic. And it's interesting that the motivation there you say about is, you so the, the lesson to your younger self is to test and stick to that. You know, no, no, that is what the, needs to happen. Stick to the things you love. Oh, yes. But stick to the things you love, but also... When somebody questions whether you need to test it, you keep stick to your guns. Absolutely. It needs it. That's, I think, the passion there. So, Shelley, what's your lesson to your younger self? What would you like to share? Well, you know what? I think Anne makes a really, really good point, and I relate to that. And I think my key word is about purpose, about finding something that gets you out of bed every single morning. And for me, even though in my early career, like my boss just hung put me in situations that I, I thought I wasn't ready for at the time. I was a young technology consultant teaching all these kind of grown up people who, who, who were grown up, right? And here I was 20, 21, teaching them new technology. Who am I? Who is this kid that's teaching them? And I think what I learned was that it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're young in the middle or you know old we all need to keep on learning and consuming and being curious and being collaborative and and using our passion to you know work with other people around you um, you know when you get really good at something and you can go deep into being good at whatever that is you need to keep moving forward at the same time so that you can you're always ready to consume that next version because you'll pull people along with you and you'll 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 learn and inspire and then you know your team or your group or your company all of a sudden you'll be standing there being being a world-class um, you know person you're in a room with a bunch of international business people and you're looking around going they don't know anything more than i know because I'm working on the current version and looking forward to the next one. So if I hadn't known that when I was 20 or 21, I wouldn't have been so nervous and, and, and you know, so worried about how the training course was going to go. So the short summary of that is it's okay to just be one or two pages ahead in the manual of something new and you haven't let, you haven't yet mastered it. It's, it's the fact that you're on it. And, and, you, and you're trying. So keep, keep that up, younger self. Good one. Good one. Thank you very much for sharing that. And that, you know, it's something about the um, imposter syndrome that women, I think, um, feel a lot more. So, you know, it's more strength to your arm in being able to address that. So actually, we um, might just quickly ask if um, Alison or Kerry have thoughts for their younger selves as well that they'd like to share with us um, and around that, um, their superpower of um, being involved in, in technology and maths and science. Alison, do you want to go first? Yes, Kerry, um, Kelly, sorry. Um, I'm not too sure that I've got a very good advice for my younger self, but I do agree with the policy, do what you like. Don't let them say, oh, you ought to be doing this subject because that will help you. No, no, no. Work hard at what you like and keep that going. And I, I knew I liked numbers and I've continued to work with numbers. And that's it. Excellent. Very good. Yes, I've, I've loved my job and, uh, and still love it. Um, I guess I've, 
uh, in my, my younger self would have had no idea about statistics. Uh, it just wasn't no. a subject that was on the radar at school. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased now to see that there's such a, a huge move towards data science and data analysis. And so statisticians can basically come out and say, yes, I'm a statistician rather than, uh, than be worried about saying that uh, because people, uh, you know, so there's much more uh, awareness uh, about data and data science and data analysis. And, um, but I would have a message for my older self actually. And so some of the, the, the proud moments also have been seeing um, people coming back um, after having kids and uh, coming back to do the, the subjects that they love, which is maths and stats. So, uh, you know, people who are saying, well, I enjoyed that as a, as a younger person. And I've had my family and, um, and I'd like to come back and learn more about it. And for them, uh, for many of them, it's a fear of like the world's changed so much in the technology and it's a lack of confidence. But in fact, it changes <coughs> for all of us. And so getting over that um, lack of confidence, but then bringing their, their, their earlier skills and all of the other experience and, um, in management and communication and so on to bear in their training and really taking um, postgraduate degrees in maths and stats as mature age students and seeing people in their, their 70s finish um, PhDs and graduate and then go on to have a career uh, in, their, in this new area is just uh, one of the, the, the best things about my job. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, if there's one thing we see today with, with, there are many different stages and many different careers. And I think, you know, that point about bringing the experience of a life post children, um, being able to bring that in, and particularly with data science and machine learning, you have to have the input of all the different perspectives. Otherwise we continue with the bias that unfortunately um, we've all experienced. So thank you so much for all of you for sharing, sharing those thoughts. So we're going to move on to our next panel session um, and talking about keeping it agile. You know, the career stepping stones that we've all taken probably over our careers. Um, we really are delighted to be able to be um, joined now by Helen Varath and Jennifer Seabury. Um, Helen is an experienced industry veteran. Um, you describe the world of IT as like the world of Alice found behind the looking glass. You know, can you describe why you see it as such? Thank you, Kelly. Um, I, I'm just picking up a thread that I think practically everyone who's spoken so far has brought up that if you know the looking glass story, the Red Queen suddenly grabs Alice by the hand and they run and run and run. And when they stop, they're still in the same place. The thing I've found wonderful about IT if, after 50 years of, of doing things in it is that you have to keep running just to stay in the same place. And this is really what I think most of the other speakers have said. The joy of IT is the fact that there's always something new to learn. You know, there's always a, you know, a new app, a new tool, a new something. And for me, that was the driver for, all, for most of the career changes. Some of them got made for, you know, those kind of strange lifestyle reasons, like you got married or you got unmarried or you, you know, something happened. But a lot of them were made because I was bored. You know, I'd learnt this and, you know, so far so good, but let's do something different. You know, I started off programming in COBOL, then I wanted to learn machine code because assembler, that was the thing that the really clever people did. And then I got involved in other things. I got out of mainframes and into mini computers from there into PCs. And I think somewhere around about, um, probably about 20 years ago, my cleaning lady said to me, I'm building a website. And I thought, hell, I'm a computer professional and here's this cleaning lady building a website. Can't be that hard, so I better build a website. So I did. So you know, when I when I run out of things to do, I uh, you know I, I just want new things, new tools to play with. And for me, the other the other privilege has been bringing other people with you. And I've you know that's you know I really related to um, Shell Melbourne's story of of how training motivates you because after I'd been you know developing systems, including some really interesting ones that were innovative for, for a while, I, I decided I wanted to have a go at teaching. I went into academia. I lasted exactly one semester. 
because as somebody said, if you don't like what you're doing, don't stay there, take a risk, get out. I hated the environment. It was the most chauvinistic place I'd ever worked. I will not name the institution for fear of shaming a whole bunch of blokes in there. Um, but I, a friend of mine at that stage knew somebody who knew somebody who was starting an organization called Micro Energy, which was about getting women back into the workforce. And it relates to, um, to what Kerry was saying, except these were the people who were at the at the bottom of the tree, the people who had been typists, who had maybe done a bit of accounting with a green account book. And we got them back into the workforce by teaching them to use computers. And we're talking about the 80s here when PCs were brand new. And so these women who had, you know, not much in the way of education, not much in the way of background, very underconfident, would learn to use a computer. And it gave them such a feeling of power and we had something like a, we had a over 90% retention rate on the courses and a over 80% placement rate. And if you know anything about getting people back into the workforce, that's way, way over the normal margins. So that was, that was very rewarding. But in the last, my current job, the current unpaid job I do, you know, five days a week and sometimes seven, is working with my local U3A and over time, I took their entirely paper-based systems and gradually moved them onto, onto computing. And slowly we persuaded people that they could renew their membership online. They could book into a class online. They could, they could use a tablet to mark off their, their attendance. And because we'd done all that, when the pandemic came, we were ready because people were comfortable with our systems to go really take our entire course offering and go online. And we have out of our 700 odd people, we're actually running more courses online now than we've ever run before because we've got no venue restrictions. And we've got all these geriatrics and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm speaking, you know, we've got members who go up into their 90s. We've got members from 55 up to, you know, 90 something who've all been patiently coaxed onto Zoom and are all now coming to their classes online. And that's been so satisfying because for these people, part of, you know, these, a lot of these are single women and for, for a lot of them, um, you know, the, being able to meet people, even if it's only online, is a really, really important part of their life. So as I, as I said, you know, I think about sometime in the 80s, I sat in Barbara Cameron's living room and we talked about why we need women in computing. And we really do because women, you know, coming back again to Michelle and the nerds, men want to know how it works. Women want to know what the hell you can do with it. You know, what can you, what can you do with it that actually makes a difference to, you know, to, to life or, you know, the environment or the community you live in. So that's what, that's what I would be saying to, to the younger selves. Take a risk, get out there, have fun and keep learning. There's so much fascinating stuff. Mm. That's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, that is the essence of Agile, isn't it? That, you know, you try, you learn, you move. And, um, you know, I think that story about the U3A, my mum's on the line and she's a passionate member of her local area. And, you know, that transition is, is that process, you know, and I think that's um, really commendable to hear about your latest adventures and um, bringing people online. And you mentioned there, Barbara, who we're also happy to have join us this afternoon. Um, I'd love to have been there for some of the conversations um, and it's really nice to bring you back together again um, and really about that women in computing and I know that Barbara you designed programs for the first computers um, and so if you can tell us a bit about that but also you know you mentioned there about women in technology and I know you're a, um, an activist and a computing great and so of course combining those two things together um, you may, it would be really great to hear some of your insights. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, well, well I, I'd been in um, some sort of technology since fairly early times, about, you know, I was 18, I was um, studying applied physics at um, what is now RMIT and working, uh, uh, which was terrific. I didn't finish it though, it was the usual thing with women, you know, marriage and children, a lot of travelling and uh, thinking of 
technology things that were still out there, um, but uh, came back to thinking about actually working with it, which I needed to do. I was raising four children and I needed something that sounded like computing would be a good, a good money earner. Um, uh, so it was uh, a matter of looking around for something that that would would fill that gap that I felt I must be able to do because it, it just sounded just like physics, no worries. And so uh, yeah, I got I got a job in 1958, and uh, there were four of us started, four trainee programmers. They had a GE computer, so you did all your studies at GE. Uh, on uh, at the premises there, there were no computer science degrees at that point in time. They came much later. And so there were four of us, three fellows and myself. And so then we started at this, uh, uh, the, 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 my first computing job, which was fine for a year or so. And then I found that those three fellows were getting much bigger salaries than I was. And that's sort of the first time when I became a feminist, really. I thought, this is not fair. I'll have to get another job. And uh, so I looked around and found uh, where I could go to, which was a shell company. Uh, I thought, well, that'll probably be a little bit more fair, although I never really found out whether, whether the salaries were equal or not, because they were too smart to let you know. <laughs> uh, so then, then it was uh, at Shell. Uh, so that was a bit different. They had a new big IBM computer. Um, and so we did uh, uh, our studies then at IBM on the languages of uh, COBOL and what was the new language then for the IBM computer, which was PIA 1. And uh, 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 then had 20 years of programming for the various sections of Shell, which of course were uh, payroll and uh, marketing, finance, uh, refineries, some polypropylene uh, program we wrote for the refineries. Really the only fun, fun we had was dreaming up a, uh, some sort of nice name for the, for the system. I can remember the polypropylene the order entry system finished up as poems and so that was fun. About all you could actually remember. <laughs> but in those days, um, programming was not with a personal computer, of course, because we're talking about the 1960s, 1970s. Personal computers didn't really start anywhere really until 1980s. So the job of a programmer was sitting at a desk, uh, writing, writing out your program as you designed it in your head with paper and pencil, all very quiet, everybody thinking. And then all those pieces of paper went across to the peak punch operators who sat there and transcribed all of that onto uh, cards, little cards about, about that big. With, with the code of design with little holes punched in it by the machine. Um, and that stack of cards then was taken over to another section of a big building that Cheryl had at the time where the very big computer was. We never actually saw where the, never saw the computer. It was tucked away behind the glass shelf. Um, but we knew our program had gone that round there and we knew it would work if, um, all the data that came down from the different areas of Shell all around Australia would be in uh, little pieces of paper. They would all also be put into uh, heat punch machines and uh, finish up with stacks of, of um, punch cards. And they would be fed into the computer. And if everything was working fine, the computer would process each and every one of those cards and give you the answers at the end. And all the management would be happy with all of their results. 
Uh, if not, if something was wrong or if something went wrong with the computer, I could be called in and I was called in a number of times, leaving four children at home to get themselves their own breakfast uh, to fix something at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., that sort of thing. So there, it was hard work. It was hard work. And you had to think, think of yourself completely as, as that person doing that job. Not anything really separate. Although I can say that at that time when I um, became a feminist, that hits me into actually joining well when it started up in Melbourne in 1972. So I was one, one of the early people to join in that year. It, it started also in Sydney and Canberra later on. So it's all still going, still trying to get there. There's still a lot of work to be done. So I, I did a lot of work then with uh, with Well. That was all at home work, of course. Um, so at that time, I, I thought I'd, I'd get myself a, a degree in um, women's history, which interested me most. Um, so at the age of 50, I, I got myself a, a degree at uh, La Trobe in women's history and uh, and, 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 and a few pieces that I wrote and helped, assisted with the establishment of the Queen Victoria Women's Centre, which is still going now. And there were pieces to write about that. There was a lot of work to be done in that campaign and many other campaigns too that you'll know about. Uh, so that's how that went, but I retired from Shell and then decided I still really wanted to do all this and perhaps to help my daughters do computing things. So I started my own business called um, Pixel Software to uh, develop software for uh, the hotel and the hospitality industry, um, which went well then for about 15 years. And uh, I was a 70 year old programmer, it was a bit silly anyway. And sold all that and started to go traveling all over the place, bought myself a nice Amper van and uh, children were grown up. I was able to afford to build them a big, a big home. And um, of course, by then the eighties and the nineties, then there was the website. So I had to do a website for well, didn't I? <laughs> so I still do that. I still do the website for Well Victoria. Uh, wellwellvic.org.au and. Uh, we're trying to get there, we're hoping to get there, but I think a website will help. Something that anybody these days can look it up, see all of our history, a lot of early um, uh, submissions that we put into the government. Most have fallen on deaf ears, some are still going some. But, but uh, unless you have many people saying things, many women saying things that they want, and especially now, which is even this week, very topical, then nothing will change. Thank you so much there, Barbara, for sharing those, um, that journey. And yes, I, I agree. Um, I don't know if you, everybody's seen a bit on Twitter this week, we've had cre hashtag credible women in the feedback to the federal budget. Um, and I think we have an immense panel of credible women here. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, being agile, seeing the opportunity, jumping through. Um, if finally, if I can ask you, what would be your advice to your younger self, um, Barbara, um, and, and also Helen, what do you think? I mean, I know you mentioned something before, but you know, maybe just capsulate that. <sighs> Oh, first to stay in, uh, you know, when you're a teenager, stay in a, a, um, a study that, um, and not just give it away lightly, because that's what women, young women did then. And basically, that's about it, because the rest of the time I just had to make the big decisions myself and get in and do things. It was hard, but uh, managed to, to keep my myself 
reasonably separate from from the work and the feminism and the rest of it uh, i think you've you've got to do that too because there was no, no one else to help there were no mentors or anything like that um we just had to do what the, the best we could and and and, and uh when when I did uh, go to university, that was part time as well. I seemed to be addicted to doing two things at once. <laughs> so I think if you want to really be successful, you might have to be doing two things at once for a large part of your life to finally yeah. succeed. Yeah, I like that idea. That's a good one. I'm definitely myself there, and I think Helen, that might be something you've lived truly as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other, mm -hmm. thing, apart from, you know, take risks and keep learning, would be something that took me a, a little while to discover. In my early days, programmers tend to, tended to work on their own. You tended to, you know, okay, you might have been in a room with a lot of other people with coding pads, but you, you sat and you solved your own programming problems. You, you worked by yourself. It took a while before I discovered the joys of working in teams. And if you're in a if you're in a bad team, it's terrible. But if you're in a good team, it is terrific because people constantly question one another in the nicest possible way about why you're doing whatever you're doing the way you're doing it. And the the synergy is is amazing. You know, I have I have a terrific team. I will be going to my weekly IT meeting this afternoon after this. And uh, it has three people in it who've all got it all started when I did at the end of the 60s. So there are three of us with 50 plus years of, of IT. There's one junior who didn't start until the 80s. <laughs> and, and one person who's just a really good communicator who does, you know, a lot of our, you know, she's the C in the IT and C group. But, you know, the joys of working with that group of people every, every week, particularly this year when we've all been absolutely flat chat trying to, to do this, you know, move people onto Zoom has been such a pleasure and I can't I can think of other teams I've worked with and how much joy there was in that compared with sitting in your corner so you know as, as Shell said you know even if you're in with a bunch of nerds you, you can you can turn them into a team women are very good at being what uh, Tom DeMarco who writes brilliantly about teams called the person who makes a team gel the person who actually gets them out to have the picnic in the park, you know, the people who do who do something to get the team to be a unit rather than just a bunch of people doing stuff, doing the, the cream bun run or the you know the the um, the ice cream run or whatever it is for the team can be really really important. Yes, that picks up on um, on what um, Anne was talking about, the caviar and the gold bullion to get the um, the um, stockbrokers. And uh, I, I must be I must be you know true that I have used sugar and lollies a lot to motivate and reward teams over the years, even fairy floss. I wanted to write a uh, you know a short thesis on the motivational power of the chocolate frog. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, one thing I think everybody on this panel today shares, and I think everybody on, on, on our audience as well, is a passion for technology. Um, and so I'm going to um, introduce two uh, of our final speakers, um, Dr. Michelle Deeker and Jan kuhn -Weibel, who have different but, again, fascinating stories to share with us this afternoon. So, Michelle, you're the Managing Director now of One Ventures. You dived into entrepreneurship leaving university and how did that actually come about? Look, it was it was one of those things, Kelly, where um, and I'll come back, I'll start with the chocolate frog point because I was always really good at maths and science at school and we had a maths teacher that always used to throw out the chocolate frog and I used to love getting the chocolate frog problem right. Um, so I, I then went on to university and I um, eventually did a PhD in applied science, but I was always very entrepreneurial. So I had an engineer as a father, um, so I loved maths and science and I had a mother that was a very creative person. Um, she'd been in performing arts and then got on to found a school in education. So I think that those two different components came together for me and when I was at university I was always 
a person that was involved. And I would get involved with the science association or being on faculty board or helping with student welfare or whatever it was, making a contribution. And I think for me, science was all about the application. So for computers and technology, it was about the application of those things. And uh, when I was writing up my PhD, my mother turned around and she said, you know, Michelle, you're not doing anything at the moment. Um, do you think you would come and help me put technology into performing arts? And uh, before I, you know, even got far into that process, I'd set up my own um, computer hardware and software company called Networks Beyond 2000. And, you know, I was building them all sorts of different types of computer labs from digital movie editing studios to language labs, etc. And this was like quite a long time ago. So it was fairly cutting edge for a school. Uh, particularly that had performing arts as its focus to actually have technology enabled facilities. And, um, and so then it turned out that I discovered that I was both entrepreneurial and I was obviously very techy and the application of technology was what appealed to me. And then I, um, my mother-in-law got a gift voucher for Mother's Day and I'd been experimenting with the internet in the early days of the internet and thinking about putting up an online store for computers, computer hardware and software. So again, always self-learning as Helen and the others were saying. And, um, and, I, and I, my mother-in-law said, um, you, know, give, you know, give vouchers online. And I, and, and I actually, uh, the conversation around the dining table was that and my husband said, you know, that's something we should, you know, look at. And I went home that day I brought all the domain names around gift vouchers online. And sure enough, um, that business then went on to become Australia's first true, truly FinTech company, where we put the technology behind the Australian prepaid cards and electronic voucher market. And probably anybody who is on this call has you know, received a My Gift Card or a, or a gift card from somewhere else and they've gone out and used it. And we actually put all that technology through the Australian banking industry and um, established the platform. And then I was rolling that business offshore into New Zealand, South Africa and the UK. And the company was acquired by a UK publicly listed company who I went and worked for for a while in a role as product development director then to develop their technology programs globally. And uh, after a while, I decided to step outside of there and I started angel investing in technology companies. Um, I had companies in data security, online advertising, mobile um, technologies, and, um, and I was mentoring a lot of entrepreneurs in technology. And one of my mentors, who was the former CEO of SAP, turned around and said, you know, Michelle, you should think about venture capital. So um, I thought, that's another good idea. Um, why don't I try that? And I looked around, I thought I would go and work for a firm and I didn't really see what I wanted, which was business building and technology experience alongside the ability to provide capital to entrepreneurs. So I set up my own firm, One Ventures, and uh, we have 420 million under management now and we funded a lot of companies in technology and also healthcare. And uh, so, yeah, my passion for technology is there and I don't think it'll ever go away. And I'd love to particularly encourage the next female entrepreneurs to actually get out there and have a go. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, I, what I find amazing about hearing these stories is all of this technology in the background, the stock exchange, our financial um, transactions there through the gift vouchers. Shell, all of these amazing technologies that have been systems that have run the economy have all had a female touch behind the scenes. Those definitely those hidden figures. So I'm really pleased because it's men who would possibly stand out there and ex ex you know exclaim their achievements. Um, whereas all these stories I'm hearing about is yeah we did this and then we tried that and it's like wow you know everybody is on the chat here saying this is gold to hear these stories. So thank you so much and that, that inspiration and to know that you're actually taking that into One Ventures and supporting the next generation is just, is fantastic. So, you know, Jan, you also um, took on a passion in your um, computing and also your personal life, professional and personal. Um, Jan is over in um, Perth, Jan Codweeble. If you'd like to explain, you know, 
why do we think about technology and the humanity around it and what has driven you over the years if you can tell us a bit about that okay um but first of all I, I guess i have to go back to how i started because it did lead on in that i must say one of the best things that ever happened to me was going traveling in the early 1960s and being in london in the swinging 60s and that's how I swung into computers because I uh, and nearly all of our friends were over in London at that time as well and when I started work after some months of travel I found that work in London was just everything was just so big that it was spoiling London for me. And we had a dinner party where I expressed this to some eight Australian Perth friends. And one guy who's still a friend typed up and said, well, why don't you do computer programming? And I said, well, you know, on the underground, there's these advertisements that say, if you can do this puzzle, you should be a computer programmer. And nobody else at the dinner party could. So we thought we'll check this out. And so I went and talked to IBM who actually recommended the actual Canadian college that I ended up doing the course with. And so you couldn't get on it unless you got 85% in the aptitude test and I got 99. And then they also warned that even though you got on the course, they only had a 10% pass rate. And so I went on this course with 20 plus people on it. Of, and it was one of the most wonderful cosmopolitan early uh, experiences I had because there were only three of us that were of Anglo-Saxon background. The rest came from all over the Commonwealth countries. But by the same token, only two of us really caught on to the course. And we spent every lunch hour and break time trying to help these beautiful people <laughs> to get through the course. So I passed it and part of the thing with the FIC Institute was that they had um, a, a pool of big companies that would take, consider taking graduates from this two month course. And so I must uh, relate to Barbara's role in Shell because I rang Shell Company in London and they said, no, we don't employ, only employ men in our computer area. So I had a few companies do that, but landed a job at Colgate Palmolive, which was an all card system, autocoder coding. And it was in Oxford Street, London, which was a great place to be. <laughs> um, but I used to one worry about the fire hazard with everything being back up of punch cards. So, but anyway, after a year working there, went traveling again and then came back to Western Australia at the end of 1966. So um, I had written to the state manager of IBM in Perth before I went uh, while still in London, but I went into the data center manager of IBM who said wanted a man that was gonna make it his career. <laughs> but luckily other IBM engineers picked up because I ended up in working for of all things the TAB, horse betting, but they were doing one of the first online systems of its type in the Southern Hemisphere. So the programmers, which were all put together by putting all the TAB staff through an aptitude test, and the three engineers we had, we wrote this online system and where the first year we tried it, which was for a Melbourne Cup, all the programmers had to go out and sit in the agencies working on a telex machine because there wasn't even um, any uh, you know way other way than the telex machines for that so that relates back to Anne's early days as well um, that I also joined the West Australian Computer Society at the time and uh, at the end of the next year we joined the Australian group of which Piercy was the president at that time. So I did know a lot about his history. And I guess it's a combination of 
the work outside plus being early, it did give me insight into what I felt computers could do, as well as enjoying developing. And so I uh, was leading a special interest group in the Computer Society in WA, looking at computers helping disability. But what I was worried about is to implement something into people's lives when people are so complex, whether you take communication, physical disability. I was getting information about the technology, but I could see it was mainly a design problem, not a technology problem. It was the practical application of it into people's lives. And I just felt if we're not careful, it would be so unethical to put stuff into people's lives, which we couldn't support. And so that I was awarded a Churchill Fellowship to study it overseas in 1981. So that's the side uh, when I, you tell me if I'm running out of time. <laughs> but um, so when I came back, because I was only running my own contracting business since having two children, um, and I related very much to Helen Reddy's uh, interview in the 1970s about because she was in show business, she could earn as much as the men and she didn't have to change her name. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, this is us. We're not in show business here. But um, I, so from the Churchill Fellowship, I then was able to use my business and support from ACS as well as the industry and was able to get about five of the main people that I worked with overseas, uh, researchers and rehabilitation experts, as well as even some computer people. But um, because I felt as though I was, you know, I was learning more about the practical application on older equipment. Apple computer came out that very year and they were in the schools, so there was a few schools that were developing special education for um, disability. But by and large, it was in putting it into people's lives, I had to get longer experience. And that was really back more in the UK, even though it was electronic equipment, not computers. Um, so with the two international um, conferences, uh, I managed to um, negotiate having a special stream on computers helping disability with not only the five people from overseas, but also people in a, within Australia who were experts in rehabilitation as much as anything. And uh, so we ran these streams aimed at the public it was computer conferences, but the stream we had was aimed at, at the public and we did it for free. So um, one was at Curtin, what was Curtin, now Curtin University, was the Institute of Technology, and that was a microcomputer conference, international. And the other was the first Pacific computing uh, conference, and that was in 1985. And the one in uh, Melbourne was, um, we had people who were ridden, wheeled in, in hospital beds. So it really was a great thing because um, now, and it's changed so much since those years in the 1980s, disabled people um, with their special needs are as vocal about what they can get as anything. But in those days, it was all just so new. So I was always appreciative of that. Thank you so much, Jan. I mean, the richness of that, that journey and the essence of design that I think you picked up on, that it wasn't a technological problem, it was a design problem. And I think all of the good application or successful applications of technology solves a problem like Michelle, you, you know, worked through that, all, all of you have, but also another point you've picked up there is ethics 
and the ethics and the role of technology um, is something that I think um, possibly is is a is a perception that women maybe take more in that idea that Helen Voreth said earlier. We want to know why we're using this. What is it going to do? How is it going to help someone? And Jan, also that ethical awareness of what would be the unintended consequences of doing this. And in the disability space, you know, your advocacy is is commendable and. We've gone through this big shift of a medicalised approach to disability to a human rights based approach. And I think it's that type of approach to technology that is, you know, what is something that's that is is definitely seen through all of you here. Um, and I think, that, you know, the future is bright if we can learn from from all of you today. So um, can I just say one more thing about yeah. ethics side when I look forward one of the big problems that worries me is the ethics in artificial intelligence. The question you said about how it will affect, what if it, you know, doesn't uh, work. I mean, I, it's so complex with artificial intelligence. It makes what I was looking at <laughs> quite small. <laughs> No, but, but the learnings from that experience is what can inform um, the ethics because technologists or engineers have always had to make decisions around the application of the technology, but do we teach engineers how to do it? So I'm going to just ask you and um, Michelle to just give us that quick wrap up about what would you tell your younger self if you could? I can't say get bored in London in the live in London in the sixties, can I? I mean, I really feel that was just the golden egg, because I didn't have the education that some of these people, women, have had today, and so it really was a wonderful. And my Churchill Fellowship was like getting a degree. So, um, and I'm now retired and work with people with autism because the research shows that they make excellent software testers. So I guess to my younger self would be for my whole age is to always take a chance in doing things. And if you really enjoy it, you know, put your whole energy into it because now I'm retired from paid work, this work, that I'm doing with Curtin University in this area, it's really a wonderful thing. So that's what I think about computing, as, as people have said, things keep moving and you keep moving and it just makes life so full. Great, thank you so much. And Michelle? Yeah, okay. I guess a couple of things. I love the diversity and inclusion angle that everyone's been mentioning here, but women need to get involved with computers if we're going to embrace the future. So I really want to encourage younger women to come through and get involved in computer and technology industry so that we can leave our mark on it as well and design the world that we want to have. But I would say, you know, um, have courage because we all have really great ideas but not many of us actually take the step to see our ideas through or see the opportunities through that present to us. So be willing to step through that door and have a go and take the opportunities that present to you. And the other thing that I'll say, which has always been true for me, is success is where preparation meets opportunity. And so always in my life where I've been investigating things and trying to learn, I've found a new opportunity that's just completely opened something new for me. And I'd like to encourage you always to keep an open mind and keep learning and prepare for what that opportunity might be that will open up your life. And it'll just, you'll find that there's so much more value to your life and you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much. So there's such amazing um, stories that you've all shared with us this afternoon. Um, and I'd like to actually wrap up now um, and conclude the session for today. So please all join me in thanking all of today's amazing speakers for not only sharing today their incredible contributions to the Australian tech industry, but also, also all of you for sharing and joining in celebrating Ada Lovelace Day. I think that we've all learnt a lot and there's also a lot of food for thought 
and we've been keeping some notes as we've gone along. I think there'll be some follow-up sessions, definitely around ethics and AI, and definitely around um, um, entrepreneurship and other applications of technology. And I think, um, you know, we encourage you all to be part of our other events for the PC Foundation. Um, we have the New South Wales Entrepreneur of the Year Award, same line that you're on now, so just um, keep it in the background. Also, please save the date for the PSE National Awards, which will be on Wednesday, the 25th of November. And our other activities will be sent to you through our mailing list. Also, if you have been interested in some of these stories, we do have a lot of um, articles that we're preparing for the Heritage Project, but also there's a number of blog articles. And um, if you'd like to go over to our Heritage site in the follow-up, there's some really good stories um, and insights about um, the different um, role models that we've, we've heard from today. And we're also encouraging people to contact us. If you think of somebody else, if you yourself would like to share a letter to your younger self or just um, contribute to one of these panels, we also encourage you to, to contact us. Um, even if you wanted to lead a panel, you know, we are really the friends of PSC as an organization. It's a volunteer organization. And really the strength of, of it is the focus on heritage feeding into the future. So I really think we've really captured that today. Um, you're most welcome to just stay around now and have a quick chat. Um, but, you know, we do thank you for your time. We know that, you know, it's a contribution of your interest in doing this. And um, hopefully you found it um, inspirational as much as we have.